Hello and welcome to the Manzanita Speaker Series. Um, I'm Grace Zabowski. I am in 10th grade and I'm part of the Institute program. And tonight we are having Hillary give us a talk about her wonderful food. She is the author of Heal Your Gut Cookbook and she is um, she runs Live Yum Yum, mm -hmm. which is her Instagram and her way of showing people that there is a way to live with a healthy gut and to help yourself from getting any harmful like stomach or um, bad sicknesses or illnesses and so she lives that beautiful life. Um, so turn your phones off. Yeah. <laughs> As a little, if you have any phones, please put them on vibrate so that she can have her message heard clearly, and um, <coughs> I would like to introduce her. <coughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much for coming. This is very exciting. Um, I'm just going to start by taking a huge breath. <sighs> because I had a lecture like a year ago and I realized after five minutes that I didn't think I had taken a breath for five minutes. I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can breathe. So I start with a breath and, and um, I've learned so much in my journey about the power of breath um, that we can go, um, I wish Chuck was here because we can go probably maybe a month or two months without food and four or five days without water, but we can't go without breath for a few minutes. So it's really important to remember to <coughs> Take a breath. So, um, I'm sorry, I have notes too, but I begged Claire not to make me put them down. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I am so grateful to be here um, as a part of the Manzanita community and to be here in the Topanga community. I feel like we've been welcomed with open arms and feel like we've landed in such a perfect spot and um, just so nice to see so many familiar faces and all you guys and some of my kids. Um, and community is such an important piece too that I've learned with health is that it's not all about food and that's been a very important lesson for me for a long time I was like oh it's this diet or that diet or you know it's got to be perfect and I've learned that community is such a big part of your health and really valuing your family or your soul family or your uh, school community your town um, being a part of something bigger than you is really important so um, that's key to health and if you ask some of the centenarians I'm sure they would say that or the blue zone people. Um, well I was going to make a, a, a little call out to some of the students but I guess it will be to Grace and to Cooper and to Dossie but I was really excited to um, share my message with a lot of the students so if they watch this tape I'm upset that you guys aren't here. Um, because I really feel like this is the generation of kids that is going to make the change that's going to demand better with our food system and our health care. And so, but it's very telling that they're not here because I don't think that um, it's quite understood. And we're all in that invincible, I just gave a talk last week to my high school, I'm like, I know you guys are all in that stage where it's like, hey, everything's good and I'm healthy and I can do whatever, but, um, you know, we all know that the challenges come. Um, so anyway, I'll get to them another time but um, and I wanted to say thank you for showing up the other day I was talking to a friend and felt overwhelmed with life like oh my gosh this kid has this and this kid has that and Nick's doing this and I gotta go home and what am I gonna do and I don't know if I can handle it all and and she said you know you show up every day and I thought oh yeah okay and then after a couple of days it kind of sank in and I was like you know what I do show up every day I really do I really try and make an effort to show up every day um, and I think it's it's important um, to make that decision. It's a choice. We all have to show up despite circumstances. We have to you know, wake up in the morning. It's like, okay, here we go again. Um, and I decided that day, I think I went on a walk. I was listening to like Tony Robbins or some inspirational or whatever. And I was like, okay, I'm going on. I'm like, I am showing up for me. I'm showing up for my family and I'm showing up for my community. And I like cleared out a whiteboard on the bottom. And I was like, I am showing up. Are you in? Like Dossie Campbell, Cooper, Wyatt Tanner, Rupee, our dog, and Nick. I mean, like, you know, check in and show up. So I really appreciate you guys showing up and it's, um, it's important to show up, to decide to show up for your health. We get this one chance, we get this one body, 
uh, one life, as far as we know right now, um, in this form anyway. Uh, so choose. Choose to be healthful. I mean, healthy, as healthy as you can. Um, and I got a text the other day from a friend um, a couple days ago that said, another trip around the sun. And I was like, it's this lifelong friend that I haven't spoken to in a long time. And I said, oh, I think you have the wrong person, but it's so nice to hear from you. And she said, isn't it your birthday tomorrow? And I said, oh, yeah, this is yesterday. It was my birthday. And I said, oh, yeah, it is my birthday. Another trip around the sun. What a nice Manzanita-ish way to put, you know, happy birthday. Um, and I thought, you know, OK, this is a really cool way. This is an opportunity. Another trip around the sun. Where do I want to be? You know, I was all upset last week or two weeks ago, like, oh my gosh, we, we may not be able to afford a house in Tobango. We may not be able to go to Manzanita. We have five kids going there. What are we going to do? I was crying, crying, crying. Miss Jennifer was there. I was like beside myself. And then like the next day, I just was like, OK, let's just flip the switch. You know, I'm OK. Like my new mantra is to find happiness <clears throat> despite circumstances. We're all going to be OK. You know, but you have to find that your cells are listening to every thought you have, every action you take, every belief. So to sit in that worry when I can't really control everything was not really beneficial to me. So I decided to flip that switch and wherever I may be enjoying my other trip around, the, my next trip around the sun, I'll be okay. Um, so on that note, I was back last week talking to my high school um, in New Hampshire, where I was from 7th to 12th grade. And there were 400 kids, so I was like, you know, this is awesome. This is so great to speak to you guys. And I, I spoke to them and I said, you know, I was trying to think of one nugget of information that I could give them that I've learned because we've had this, you know, almost 15 year process of a health crisis almost if you will of like from infertility to having triplets to having two more kids and five under four which is feels like a crisis sometimes but not quite a health crisis and then eggs baby with eczema and then a child with epilepsy and then a dad with alzheimer's and then my husband got cancer and so it's been this big long um journey and i was trying to think of what i could uh, say to them and i i came to the point that I think is really important is to trust in the process. Um, you know, we all will have challenges. Like I said to them, you feel invincible right now, but inevitably, whether it be with school, with work, with friendships, with your health, you will have a challenge. And so being in that process sometimes is very hard. Um, and you just want to go from A to Z like that. You just want it to be over. And sometimes it's like, oh, like Doss even says, God, if I could just Get rid of my epilepsy. Wouldn't life be greater? You know, if Nick's jaw would just heal, wouldn't we be able to go do this? Or, but it's really um, in that process where the growth and the life experience and the life lessons come. And so trusting in that process. I had a teacher, my English teacher and my soccer coach back then said to me, you know, Hillbill, he used to call me Hillbill, and he said, you can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. Because this is a pattern in my life. Take on, take on, take on. Then breakdown. So, and I thought about that, and I keep that with me, that, you know, despite, or whatever your challenge is, yeah, you can really only chunk it off one bite at a time. So really trusting in that process. So if you have a health challenge, um, sometimes <coughs> it's uh, difficult to wrap your brain around. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but so many gifts come in that process. So being present to that. So I was, um, struggling with what message I was going to say today. And, uh, you know, such an inspiring, amazing group of people. And what am I going to do? And I, you know, I have this type A perfectionist type of attitude, like it's got to be perfect. And then Dr. Paul, um, oh, I would do rounds in my skyline, Topanga skyline, like walking around, reciting my speech. And like, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't say anything. With my hands in the air, I'm like, no one, you know, thinking that I'm in this bubble that nobody could see. It's probably on like next door, like crazy mom with five kids walking around, talking to herself. Um, but it was my only quiet time. You know, it's either like the car by myself or on a walk. And then Dr. Paul sent out this video clip in the Manzanita message about um, storytelling. And my college roommate had said to me, you know, Hillary, your, your story is what sets you apart. Your story is what people need to hear. And really, Manzanita is about storytelling. So instead of, you know, my slideshow, my farm to table dinner, and all these grandiose ideas I had of what to do, I thought that my story would be really what would resonate with, with people. So, um, and then it dawned on me, I said to Nick the other day, that my story reminds me so much, and I think mostly everybody here is from Manzanita, maybe 
not a few, but um, reminds me of Joanna Macy in The Great Turning. And for those of you, don't, is anyone not familiar with Joanna Macy? Yeah, so she's an environmental activist in her 80s, and she's just this amazing, inspirational woman who talks. Dr. Paul showed this video called The Great Turning, where um, she talks about the kind of the old story with the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, everything's getting bigger and bigger, and we're like completely saturated, and we can't sustain how we're doing things right now. We have to turn back, and it's this great turning, and it's, it's happening, but it's not happening fast enough. And there are millions of organizations around the globe um, jumping on this bandwagon, but we have to move faster and get to the, the new story, which is sustainable. Earth. Um, so I was thinking about our story. It's kind of like we've had this old story um, back in Massachusetts where we were for uh, 40, 40 years of my life, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, and this health journey and health crisis and whatnot. And I lived in that old story for a long time. And I talked about it a lot. And you know, oh my gosh, can you believe I can't have babies? And then, oh my gosh, then we have triplets, and isn't this exciting? But then, oh my gosh, now I have the eczema baby, and everyone's scratching, and you know, the story. Then Nick gets cancer, Dazi has epilepsy, and we didn't tell the family, and then the judgment rains down, and it's the story. Then we picked up our five kids, and we move across the country to California, and we left all our friends and family, and we shook everything up, and just, you know, judgment rained down, and poor me, and oh, like, badge of honor, I'm still marching away and holding everything together, and isn't this great? Um, but then I realized, I've realized out here kind of, so I've had this great turning of coming to California, Manzanita and whatnot, I feel like I have this, this new story that I'm kind of working on now and I'm more aware that the story is just a story. You know, it's very important because it's the reason why I am who I am today. It's the reason why I feel so passionate to spread this message and so I like to think that um, things do happen for a reason possibly and that I am um, I'm, you know, in line with my destiny, per se, to kind of get this message out there and tell that story, but not live in that story. That it's there for a reason, but then let it go. So when you have those, they don't do anything good for you if you live in that, you know? Be thankful for the lessons you learned and then move on and then give happy. I, I came across a little um, thing a couple days ago about Snow White and how the seven dwarfs, so think of yourselves as listening to you and the, as the seven dwarfs were like all grumpy, like going off to the mines and oh, and then, um, and then Snow White came into their lives and they're like, oh, and they're like singing, I hope, I, you know, they're all happy and all she did was give them love and attention and affection and so when you bring that into your life, that's what yourselves respond to. So trying to be mindful um, is important. So, um, and, you know, so the question is kind of like how to motivate people to flip their switch. Why do we wait for that wake-up call in, in health? Some of you, you know, some people think I'm a little crazy, believe it or not. That, you know, she's that crazy lady. She only feeds her kids this. She doesn't allow that. And she's, oh, it's all about food. My family thinks I'm crazy. Nick's family thinks I'm crazy. Hopefully they're not watching this. But um, <laughs> they, they don't have access to it. But, um, but you know, some of you will get a diagnosis of something or you'll know somebody with, all of a sudden you get a cancer diagnosis or you get diabetes or you have a kid with autism or you have, I mean, these young kids, I want these young kids to be here because this, this is like I'm ha hearing about it in my 30s and 40s, friends, 25 friends who've had cancer and this young generation is going to be in their 20s and 30s that they're going to start hearing about it. So it's like, don't wait for the frying pan to the head. Don't wait for the wake-up call. What's the psychology behind, is it human nature? Why do we wait for that? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, like, what is that? So I'm investigating, investigating that now. Um, so I will get into our story because I think it's important that you guys know our story a little bit. It could be a two-hour story, but I'm going to shorten it up. But um, I wanted to say first that... Um, when Dr. Paul, my very first day at Manzanita, two years ago, he said um, something that stuck right with me that day. He said he was talking about the Manzanita seed and how it has to go through fire to become a tree and to blossom and grow up, right? And he said, our own genius needs to go through ordeals to become truly awake and alive. 
And I thought, I was like, wait a minute, get my phone. Oh my God, say that again. Like I was ty <laughs> typing it down, it's still in my phone. And I look back at that a lot because I thought, okay, I had this like aha moment, like this is it. This is why I'm here. Like we've been through all these ordeals and, um, and this is an awakening to some extent. You know, here we are. So that's why I'm here. He also said something very important. He said, your children need mentors other than you. And I thought, oh, that's genius. Like, thank you. Mm -hmm. They do. Like, I, you know, you try and do it all. You try and think like, they, why aren't they listening to me? Like, come on, I'm your parent. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of food. And um, I mean, Cooper and Dossie can attest to this, that I am like, want, 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 want. Like, it's like, whoosh, whoosh, like, okay, whatever, mom. And they're just, you know, wanting what every other kid is having. having. So I really want these um, teenagers, like, Grace, please, for the love of God, start switching your thought process around food and start mentoring these younger kids. I mean, Cooper is old enough to start being a mentor. He still needs some mentoring, but, um, but the, the parents, the teachers, the teenagers, we need to all collaborate on this. It is like, a, I mean, I feel like a salmon, just like swimming upstream. I need somebody else to bring oranges to football. I mean, Nick brought orange slices and one kid ate one slice. And then, you know, Wyatt's basketball game is getting Gatorade and Dunkin' Donuts. He's eight years old and played 10, 15 minutes. And that's the status quo. That's what's going on. You're sitting in the stands. People are eating Sour Patch Kids, drinking Red Bull at 10 o'clock in the morning. They're no longer asking parents to give, um, to bring snacks. They're like, just let's just give uh, every kid, bring $2 for each kid and they'll go to the, the snack shack and get a crappy snack. So that's what we're up against. And so I really want to call on all of you to please just set, have higher standards. You know, don't just lead by example. Be like, guys, that's not cool. I was back home and my, my brother-in-law went and bought my two nieces. Like I have a picture of my two nieces with like sweet tarts and slushy and Sour Patch Kids and other slushy. And they're little and I'm like, oh, and they have big smiles on their faces. And I get it. Like, who doesn't like sugar? And, um, and then I bought my nephews, like two little maple syrup, like Minutemen, you know? And I was like, and they're happy and they're smiling. And I was like, what's the difference here? Like one's natural and it's okay to have sweets. That's a natural thing that we desire. But one's totally processed and filled with, you know, food dyes and fake sugars and sweeteners and all that. And so, um, waking up to that and kind of inviting you guys to please jump on that bandwagon. And I feel blessed that the Manzanita kids that I, I want to speak, I mean, maybe I'll have an opportunity to speak again to just the Manzanita kids because I feel like y you guys have done an incredible job of connecting these kids to nature and in us parents. And so I meant to bring my little foxglove. Every time I go for a walk, I pull, I think it's a foxglove, I pull um, just one of the you know, not the dead ones that stick in your shoe, but one of the live ones, and I pull on it, and it just pop, pulls right out, and it's just this perfectly round cylinder. It's perfect. Every time you pull it out, it's designed to work. There's little tubes in it that the, you know, it feeds on, and the microbes, whatever, it's all working. And so the Manzanita kids are so nature-connected in the parents and understanding this, but then how can we not understand that we are part of nature, that we are no different? We are that foxglove. We are that redwood. We are that butterfly. We have intricate systems working inside of us that are um, working every single day, 24 billion cells a day, we slough off and regenerate. So we're constantly, 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 we're made up of trillions of cells, trillions, good bacteria, bad bacteria all over us. And so just as we stand in awe of something in nature, we need to start standing in awe of ourselves. And just as you wouldn't pour a little gasoline around the base of a redwood tree, why are we drinking Red Bull and, you know, Coca-Cola? I mean, maybe one time around the redwood it's going to be fine, but if you do that day in and day out, it's not going to survive. And so that's what's happening here. And so it's that awareness of really understanding that we, we deserve that same respect. So, 
Um, okay, so I will get to my story a little bit so that you guys can understand why I'm speaking so passionately about this. Um, I was in 10th grade. Are you in 11th? I'm in 10th grade. 10th grade. So I was your age when Fat Free came in. So I don't know if you remember or you've heard about that. You don't remember, but um, <laughs> I went to my 25th high school reunion. Um, so 10th grade, it was like this huge marketing thing. Fat is bad. Nobody should be having fat. You know, it was out with the eggs, out with the bacon, in with this processed cereals, and, um, and my mom fell for it and was like, Weight Watchers desserts and this and that. And I was like, okay, this is the answer. I, I was an athlete, and I was concerned about my body shape and whatnot, and um, I was taxing my body traveling around the world and then went off to a Division I school to play soccer, and I ended up with fr um, stress fractures in both femur bones, which are pretty big bones and both uh, tibias my senior year in high school because I was replenishing with nothing, nothing beneficial. I was so conscious if it said no fat, I would have it. I didn't look at the sugar, I didn't look at the dyes, I didn't look at anything. So I went off to college thinking I had all the answers and this is great and you know, and obviously then had a few alcoholic beverages and was not, you know, taking care of my body in any way but yet was working it out over and over and over again every day. Um, and I even tried to design my own major of nutrition and fitness thinking that I had all the answers and thank God they wouldn't let me do it because I don't know what I would have come up with then. But um, So anyway, fast forward, I met Nick my senior year in college and fell madly in love and we got married when I was 25 and when I was 26, boom, I got pregnant. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great, what a surprise, this is great. And then shortly thereafter, boom, I had a miscarriage and I was like, what? What is this? Wait, I didn't even know what a miscarriage was. Like, what's going on? Devastated. My sister-in-law, who married my brother, called me that same day. I'm pregnant. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just lost a baby. And so the stress started to come in and um, went on for three years. That I had three more miscarriages over three years. Probably the worst time of my life. Worse than cancer, I think. Just trying to, you know, when you have that natural instinct of wanting to have a baby. And then you're 26 and you can't. So uh, through the great technology of in vitro fertilization and whatnot, which we went through, we ended up with triplets. And um, life was good again, happy, happy. We had you know, three years of trying, three kids, and two boys and a girl. It was perfect. Everything was great. Stressful, but great. Um, and I felt that relief now looking back. So I think ultimately I taxed my body. I was not feeding it anything proper. Um, so couldn't hold a baby and then the stress that came in from what went on for three years just continued to wreak havoc on my whole system. So obviously the triplets came along, a little bit of that lifted and then when they were three I thought oh maybe we should have one more baby, just see what it's like to have one and we'll go back to in vitro and boom I got pregnant and he stuck. So it was like great, oh my gosh, we have this one little baby. So I had the triplets were three, and then I had a baby who um, was a boy, and w within two months, he broke out head to toe in eczema. Scratching every night, like ridiculous, you know, miserable little baby with his hair wasn't coming in. I'd slather him in Vaseline. I'd have to pin him to my body for two hours every night and just kind of soothe him, and I tried everything. I went to the allergist. I went to the homeopath. I went to every doctor I could, and um, I didn't know what to do and I didn't want to put the steroid cream on him, I didn't want to give him the Zyrtec. My homeopath was like, if you do that it will drive it deeper into his system and then the allergist is like, I don't even know what that means, that doesn't make any sense. So I was like, oh, like I have these two totally different sides of the story and you know, who am I going to believe? What am I going to do? And then my mom's friend who's a pediatrician said, Hillary, you have got to put this poor child on steroid cream. And I think I got poison ivy around the same time and as I was like blow drying my arm, like, oh, this feels so good because it hurts, it scratched so bad or itched, um, I decided, okay, I will put him on the steroid cream. So I put him on steroid cream and Zyrtec twice a day and sure enough, we all started sleeping and it went away and life was good again. Uh, but I knew in my heart that it was that it was a band-aid. Because as soon as I would forget to put it on, it would flare again. So I thought, you know, something's going on inside. It's not. This is not the answer. So that was really telling to me. Um, and 
I happened to be come across Alice Waters from the Edible Schoolyard and Jamie Oliver from Food Revolution. Triplets were still little, so they were like, you know, four now or so, and I started to think about changing the school lunches. My kids weren't even in school yet, but I was like, we're gonna change the school lunches. And so I met this woman who had tried years before, and she's like, if you decide to do it again, I'll do it with you. So we started out, and she kept mentioning this Weston Price, and Weston Price this, and Weston Price that, and I'm like, what is she talking about? Like, there's a town next to us called Weston, and I had no idea what she was talking about. And then um, I ended up telling her about Wyatt, and she said, you've got to put this kid on raw milk. This is what I've been telling you about, this Weston Price. And I was like, what the hell is raw milk? Like, I had never even heard of it. And, um, and she said, there's this guy, Weston A. Price, who was this dentist in the 20s and 30s in Ohio, and he noticed um, that his patients were all having narrowing of the jaw, crooked teeth, cavities, and he was like, what's going on? Things did not used to be like this. And he and his wife set out on an um, excursion across the world, across the globe, to look for, to find perfect health. And um, they went to all these little non-industrialized pockets of the world, from the Maasai to the Aborigines to the Swiss Alps um, to the Maoris in New Zealand, all over. And they found these little pockets of villages where people were thriving, free of disease, beautiful broad bone structure, perfectly straight teeth, no cavities, no heart disease, no cancer, and they were happy and solid. And he studied their diets. He thought it was going to be a vegetarian diet that was going to be the healthiest, but he found that um, that nobody, even the one uh, Maasai tribe that was mostly vegetarian was eating bugs and insects to get their fat soluble vitamins in there. A and D. So um, he noticed that they had some commonalities, that they all were eating the whole animal. They were having bone broths, they were having fermented foods, they were having raw foods like sauerkraut and raw milk and all this, and they were giving them the enzymes to feed their guts. Um, and so he wrote a book, called, I meant to bring it, called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, because what he saw was that, and he looked in every single person in the tribe's mouth, it's not over yet, Coop. Um, and <laughs> he looked in everybody's mouth and studied their, uh, their teeth, and he documented it all. And then one generation removed, when in came the white flour and the white sugar, in came the narrowing of the jaw, in came the crooked teeth, in came the cavities, in came the heart disease, cancer, disease settles in, and then malformities and all sorts of things, the next generation. So this book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, documents it all with photographs, so you can really see, and it was like, wow. Um, you know, this is incredible. And so, but I was still like, okay, whatever, you know, let's go with the raw milk, like I'll try anything. And so she said, you know, might we belong to this little co-op that's kind of underground, because it was illegal in Massachusetts to buy raw, raw milk. You could buy it off the farm, but you couldn't, I couldn't go get your raw milk. I could go get raw milk for me and then pick up your Oxycontin and your cigarettes and your bourbon on the way home and give it to you, but I can't pick up your raw milk. So there was this sort of underground co-op that was going on where I remember when I had to, when it was my turn to pick up, I had like five babies in the car, essentially I'm driving into Cambridge by Harvard University or Arlington, and I like pull up next to this like chain link fence, there's a little walkway, and I'm like, okay, everyone stay in the car, I like walk down the walkway, and it opened, there's like a shed with a padlock, and I open up, and there's just like a fridge. I open the fridge, there's like all this raw dairy. I was like, oh my God, I am like really <laughs> undercover here. Like this is like <laughs> contraband. So, um, and we did that. And I put my child on raw milk and cod liver oil and he was completely healed. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh my gosh, real food just healed my son when everybody said, you know, he needs this. He's probably gonna have asthma and allergies. They just go hand in hand. When that's not what he needed. He needed the healthy fats. Um, to feed his skin, his body, everything. So lo and behold, there was a Weston Price type conference in the next town over like a month later and I was like, I'm going, I'm in. And I, um, but I had been kind of in survival mode of you know all these little kids and I, in the middle of the night, my right eye would take 10 seconds to open up and I thought I had shingles and I was drinking lattes every morning and wine at night and just like surviving. I mean, we had five under four. So I'm sitting there with my latte listening to Sally Fallon, who is the founder of the Weston A. Price Foundation. She, um, 
she believed so much in his research that she started a foundation and she wrote a cookbook that has become a Bible for many mamas called Nourishing Traditions and it's all about going back to traditional methods of cooking and really highlighting recipes from around the world and traditional cultures. Um, so I sat there with my latte listening to her speak and she showed these pictures of these tribal people with these beautiful broad bone structures of white teeth and whatnot. And it just was like click, 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 click. I was like, oh my gosh, I get it. I get it, I get it. You know, throw out the latte, like this is it. This is the way we have to go. And I walk outside and there's like the Amish set up there with their raw milk and cheese. And they're like, we need someone to run a co-op in Massachusetts. I'm like, I will do that. And so I signed up, I ran an underground co-op out of my house in one of Nick's buildings for like six years in Massachusetts. I would wake up at sometimes four in the morning to meet the truck. It would come on like a Walmart truck and this one little pallet of our fresh food and, um, and I'd unload it and everybody would get their, their food. But I felt so passionate that people should have access to this food. Um, and actually, when we moved to California, the same Amish are supplying a co-op a mile down the road from our house. So we were like, oh, we have our food. Um, so anyway, I became so indoctrinated with food as medicine that I went back to get a degree to be a holistic health counselor. I w had wanted to go back to school, but we had all these kids. And finally, the school, it was in New York. And Nick's like, you, you can't leave me. And it went online. And I was able to do it online. I wanted some sort of certification so I could feel like I could educate people about this. And I started teaching cooking classes out of my home. and. Um, and then, uh, so shortly thereafter, sweet little Dossie started doing this, like rolling her eyes up. And I'm like, oh my god, she's getting an attitude. She's rolling her eyes at me. And, um, but then we s shortly figured out Nick's brother had had epilepsy. So his mama said, this looks kind of familiar, and you should have her tested. And so we had her tested. And sure enough, she was diagnosed with petite mal epilepsy, where she'd roll her eyes up. Um, just for a few seconds, uh, but several times a day. And so we try, you know, this was bigger than eczema, so I was like, okay, we gotta like pull in the big dogs here, and we had her on all sorts of different medications and cocktails of medications and tried all sorts of things, and nothing seemed to really work. And so I was constantly searching for a way to heal her. And um, I, f I came, in one of my cooking classes, this woman said to me, oh my gosh, you have to meet my medical intuitive. I'm like, oh God, like what the heck is a medical intuitive? And Nick is going to divorce me if I do one more holistic therapy and pay for it. And so I nicely emailed this woman. I was like, will you come? It was a lot. I know, we're still... <laughs> He's a trooper. So um, I said, will you come meet with us and just tell us what you do and talk to us first before we spend more money on another holistic therapy? And she, um, she came out and drove out nicely and spent two hours with us. And we kind of told her our story. And she said, wow, you guys need the GAPS diet. And I, and I was like, wait, what? Um, I had been to the several Weston Price conferences now and had heard about this GAPS diet, which stands for the Gut and Psychology Syndrome. And it was founded by this Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who is a neurologist and a nutritionist who lives in England. And she recovered her child from autism with this diet, which is about healing and sealing leaky gut. And I had gone to her lectures and I'd even asked about Dossie and she wasn't so sure it was the answer. but. It was this daunting two-year protocol that was like, oh man, like how can we do that? And then this medical intuitive was like, you need the GAPS diet. And she took out her um, whiteboard and her markers and drew a healthy gut and a leaky gut. And Nick was like, okay, I get it now. And so when you, when you have a, um, so the health of your gut affects the health of your whole body. Hippocrates said, um, all disease begins in the gut. So it's really important. We, ha we all have good and bad bacteria in our gut. Um, and so the best way I can explain, so I want to get in a little bit so everyone understands what leaky gut is. And it's really important for your generation to understand this too, because you guys have an opportunity before having children to rebalance your guts. And just so you all feel better, most everybody has leaky gut in some way. So it's not anything that any, some people are just worse off than others. Um, but so when a baby, well, so the average baby today has 287 toxins in their cord blood alone. So babies today are starting out toxic just from Whatever we breathe in, what the mom breathes in, the thoughts, beliefs, whatever, um, you know, we've introduced 
antibiotics, vaccines, whatever, all this stuff is, but the, the average baby's starting out with that in their core blood. The mother, when the baby goes through the birth canal, the baby swallows a big gulp of what becomes their first inoculation of gut flora, their first bacteria. And so the average mom today, including myself, probably doesn't have very good gut flora compared to our great grandmothers. So our great grandmothers didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have vaccines, they didn't have processed foods, they were all breastfed, they didn't have this, I mean they might have that stress, but maybe not to the level that we have today. They're not running a mile a minute, they're not breathing in so many toxins. So when you think about what they passed on compared to what we pass on, um, it was so much better. So we can't totally control everything, but that's why I'm passionate about controlling what we can. We can control what we put in our mouths, we can control what we put in our skin. Your skin's your largest organ and absorbs, I think, maybe like 60% of what you put on it, and that affects everything inside your microbiome as well. So your microbiome is, we all have good and bad bacteria in our guts, and you want to have, you know, maybe 85% good, and that will keep the bad in check. And what happens when you introduce things, when you start out, you know, the baby starts out compromised, and it doesn't inherit good gut flora, then it maybe it gets a vaccine day two of life, then it gets an ear infection and gets antibiotics, and then it gets um, bronchitis and gets another round of antibiotics, and then it's not breastfed and it's getting soy formula, and then they're on to, you know, baby food with pesticides, whatever it may be, they're breathing in, whatever, and their bad bacteria starts to win out over the good. This is all stuff that's just hammering the good bacteria. And so when the bad starts to proliferate and um, take over, so when you have a round of antibiotics, you wipe out everything. So you're essentially starting over. So you have these, your, your gut is, you know, food goes in your mouth, it should come all the way out the other side without going anywhere else, just right down through your digestive tract. You have these beautiful little villi inside your intestinal lining that are like grass-like villi that are absorbing nutrients and whatnot. And what happens when the bad bacteria outweigh the good is that they start to wear down. It's like having a lawnmower, just come in and cut them. And that protects, you know, your lining. And so when those are cut down, the, bat, the food particles and proteins and whatnot, get, you get cracks in your lining and they seep out and get into your bloodstream. And your body sees them as foreign invaders. So like, hey, who are these guys? What's going on? And so it launches uh, maybe an autoimmune response, something like MS or um, lupus or allergies, or can cross the blood-brain barrier and have things like um, autism, ADHD, schizophrenia. So they wreak havoc. So keeping things in the gut is really important. Um, so Nick and I started the GAPS diet then right away. We understood leaky gut. We were like, okay, we need this for our family. We started it like the next day or two. We started our kids the first day of their vacation. We're like, surprise, you're gonna have soup for breakfast like every day for the next month. And <laughs> they were okay the first day and then they were like, oh, soup again, like no. So, um, so we, I know, it was like insane looking back on it, but, um, but we did it. And you know, you kind of quickly, your taste buds start to adjust and you just don't, um, I almost wish we could go back a little bit sometimes because then once you get reacquainted with sugar, it wreaks havoc again. So, um, so I started teaching GAPS principles in my cooking class and there was a woman in my class who was also on GAPS, who was a photographer. And she and I both agreed that it was very confusing and there was nothing really online. It was like everybody, one person said this and one person said that. And I was like, oh, what do we do? What stage? Because it's the GAPS diet, I should have explained, is a, um, there's an introduction diet that really will heal and seal your gut if you have something serious that you want to go back or you want to dive right in. Um, a lot of people are not familiar with traditional foods as, as medicine, like bone broths and fermented foods and whatnot, so they start on the full GAPS diet which is much like a paleo diet, and they go back when they're ready to start the introduction diet, which is a six-phase elimination diet, where you're eliminating essentially anything that bad bacteria can feed off of. So even fibrous stalks on cauliflower and broccoli, your bad bacteria will feed off that. So you're having lots of bone broths with healthy animal fats and, um, and certain vegetables, and then you can add an egg yolk, then you can add an avocado. It's this very um, thought out, process of, you know, you know, I say with GAPS, it may not be the answer for everybody, but you certainly have this baseline where you know what your body does like and what it doesn't like. So it's a, it's a roadmap, per se. So 
Mary, my co-author, said, you know, she was like, we need to write a book. And I was like, we do. There's just like nothing out there. And, um, and so I pitched it to this. My friend had written a cookbook, so I pitched it to her publishing company. And we got this deal. And we just like set off full force and, you know, did everything all summer long. And it was like, go, go, go. And, um, and it was great. And we handed it over to our publishing company that fall. And then like two weeks later, Nick got a diagnosis of throat cancer. So I was like, oh, geez, like, wow. Um, so we had, so in our efforts to heal our family with food, we, there was a lot of judgment, a lot of like, wow, you know, we just want to take your kids to Dunkin' Donuts or no, not everything we have is organic and you guys are, you know, so, um, righteous about everything and, you know, but when you have that, like I said before, when you get that diagnosis or you have that child that's suffering, um, you flip that switch, you know, things are different. You look at things differently and you're very like mama bear, like, you know, I have to protect my child because it's out, everything, it's everything and everyone is trying to feed them sugar almost. So um, this judgment had kind of come down on us. And so when he got cancer, we were like, oh man, like, and Nick had been not doing that well. He was super, like, as soon as I found out, I was, oh, so I had my fourth baby. And then when he was six months old, I found out I was pregnant with my fifth baby. So we had five, five babies. And as soon as I found out I was pregnant with my fifth, Nick started having panic attacks. I think that's when my ride, I went open in the middle of the night. It was just like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was like, oh man. And then we had this house and family business and stress, stress, stress. It was just like doggy paddling. And I thought Gaps was going to like, fix everything and he lost 30 pounds but he was just super stressed and like I said stress plays a big role and maybe making poor lifestyle choices with having too many drinks after work whatever trying to kind of self-medicate and calm the stress in his body and so we knew that if we had gone right and told everybody Nick's got cancer that he'd be like you know marched right in like let's go in and get chemo radiation everything will be fine you'll be great don't worry about it and that's really what essentially the doctor said like you know you have to just do this 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 and you'll be fine not like let's take a look at why you got cancer like like what's going on in your life like what are you eating what are you drinking like why are you stressed like there was not really any of that and I knew from my studies that it goes deeper than just bad luck you know you think if you get a diagnosis you really have to think about why and you really have to dig deep and that is something that Nick has done more than anybody I know um, so I do a, a, a talk about an analogy of a dirty fish tank because you think of, you've probably been to a fair where you get a little fish and you put him in the tank and he's all happy and he's swimming around and um, he poops and you feed him and he poops and you feed him and he's like, you know, good for a couple weeks but then the tank's looking all murky and the fish is like, oh, this is not good and <laughs> you're like, I don't really like in the tank, it's kind of gross, maybe I'll just give him some better food and organic food or whatever, I'll give him a little medicine and hope that he does better, but if you don't clean the tank, it's not going to get better, right? So it's the same with us. Like, we have this tank here that, you know, if you run right into treatment sometimes, you know, if your tank's not clean, how are you going to flush all that out? How are you going to, how is it going to work? How is it going to fight? How is your immune system going to fight? So we really felt like it was important for Nick to, um, to clean up his body first and then get ready to, to fight. And we... Fought the good fight for like eight months and did like everything you can ever imagine possible from like GC math from England to cannabis oil in South Africa to cupping to coffee and it was to juicing and Gerson and chi therapy and breath therapy. And I mean, you name it, we were like, and nobody knew. I'm like, how could nobody know? We were like all over the place. But um, anyway, we tried we tried it all. And, um, and after eight months, it had gotten a little bit bigger. And we were like, oh man, we got to do something now. And there happened to be this clinic in California that said, we do this more alternative treatment, this low dose radiation with hyperthermia. And so we're like, okay, whether it was an escape or whatever, we were like, we're out. And so, um, you know, there was one chemotherapist, um, the head of oncology said you, to Nick, you cannot survive if you do not do chemotherapy. And that is, I think, when Nick was like, this is not okay with me. I know that's not true. And so we um, kind of took the road less traveled. We sold our house. We picked up our five kids. We moved across the country to a better way of life, less stress, to get a more alternative way of treatment and, um, and a new way of life, a new story. And I do remember my yoga teacher saying to me, you know, like, you can run away. You can go wherever you want. But happiness is here. Your problems will follow you wherever you go. So that is a lesson that I've learned in coming to California that 
you know, things do follow you, like my old story. It was in my head for a long time, but, um, but I was able to let that go. So, um, my book, okay, so I won't get into too much of the other stuff, but my book released uh, two weeks after we arrived in California, so it wasn't like ideal time. I didn't really know anybody, I didn't know anybody here. Um, but, and it was in treatment. The kids were in like this magnet school in Marina Del Rey where they were the minority. They came from this like pristine little colonial town in Massachusetts with their little cute little perfect school they walked to and then boom, they were like in Marina Del Rey like with, you know, all walks of life from downtown LA and um, in uniforms and uh, I look back and they were like 10, 7, and 6. Their dad was in treatment and so it was a real testament to the power of um, resiliency of children and what they're capable of. Um, my book released and um, and I went out and I was like, okay, I'm just going to start talking to people about it and get the message out there that um, you know, food is medicine and here we go. And I learned over the course of time that I learned three very important things from my book. One, that people are very sick. Like I get letters from people all over the world saying like, I have this and my daughter has this and what do I do when I need help and I don't know what to do. And, um, and so it was just very telling and things that I'd never really come across before. So it was just layer upon layer of disease and much younger ages. And then secondly, I've learned that um, the people are healing with food alone. I would get letters from people saying, thank you so much for the first time we're healing with food when every doctor said we needed this. And wow, I did your diet and it worked. Imagine that. And then, this is why I think I landed in the right place, is that LA, everybody that I would meet from another country would look at my book and say, wow, and it's based on all traditional methods of cooking, like your great-grandmother, and say, wow, this is the way we ate growing up and we were never sick. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until we came to America that we really started to adopt some of the standard American diet and our kids became sick or our grandkids became sick or now I'm struggling with this. Mm -hmm. And so it was really telling to me um, that, well, these elders are really, um, and these people from these other countries, like Weston Price, I feel like sometimes I'm like, maybe I'm like the young generation Weston Price. I gotta capture all this knowledge from these these people because I feel like there'd be a one generation of people left who truly remember firsthand cooking this way and learning from their grandmothers and their great grandmothers and standing in the kitchen with their moms and the lifestyle that went around, not just the food, but how they valued food and where they sourced it from and knowing who raised their food or killing an animal and the process of that and the full circle of life and what it gave them and being thankful and gratitude for the food they have. Um, and so I started to really think about that and I started Live Yum Yum as a brand to build awareness, to encourage people to get back in their kitchens, learn to cook, take control of their own health and prevent disease and then pass it on to this next generation of kids mm -hmm. so that you guys can live a life free of disease. Because right now, the way it's going, your generation is destined to have a shorter lifespan than our older generations. So, um, so it is important to really wake up. And I don't say that out of fear, because for a long time, my mantra was have hope after Joanna Macy. It was like, have hope, not fear. Have hope, not fear. And so I don't say that out of fear, but I say that out of really like kind of a wake-up call. Like, it's the truth. It's reality right now. You know, we're headed down this, like Joanna Macy said, we're just, it's not sustainable the way that we are treating our bodies and, um, and the food that we're ingesting and that we think is okay. The status quo is not okay. It's not normal. It's not the way we're intended. So um, I feel like cooking is a lost life skill that should be back in every school. When I first came across Manzanita, really basically, we stumped the first day Nick got out of bed and we were like, let's go to this Topanga that people are talking about. Like, what is it? No idea. We have been from Marina Del Rey to Santa Monica to uh, Mar Vista, and we finally we drove up here, and the, this woman at Pebbles was like, "There's this great new school, and there, you know, people are moving here for it. And it's all nature-based." And we're like, "Cool!" So we drove and we checked it out. We met um, Chef EJ, and she was like, "Oh, like the kids had just cooked, caught their own fish and cooked it that day." And I, my jaw was like on the ground. And then she's like, "I really want to roast a whole goat," and I was like, "What?" 
Like, I am in the right place. Oh my gosh. So then we like continue to kind of stalk Manzanita. Well, you don't know that, but we would like come and just be like looking, like how cool we're all eating together, and this is so cute. And then as time went on, we were like, oh, I don't know if we can afford it, and we ended up manifesting, and it all worked out, and our, our kids ended up there. But it it should be taught in every school. I think sometimes I've missed my calling of being like a home ec teacher and to go back and and teach. Um, so this is sort of the the new story. Really, and I feel like Manzanita is on the cutting edge of um, of tying it all together. I've said to Dr. Paul, like the nature connection is like spot on, and it's opened my eyes in in way. You know, I walk around and I'm like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the moon, thank you for the stars, thank you for the flowers, thank you for this, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Like, I mean, it's just like I don't make it to many of the hot days, but I am out there thanking everything, you know, and I'm talking to the manifesting and angels, everything. Um, so my nature connection has. Um, I didn't even have nature connection before, so now I, I have it, which I'm thankful for. And I really feel like this connecting us, you know, really realizing that we are part of nature um, is, is the key. And transforming, I read the other day, transforming yourselves is the best way to transform the world. Right? So we're not meant to be these humans living in fight or flight. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. That is not what our biology intended for us to do. Like, so we have our adrenal system and we have our immune system. Our adrenal system is going to like save you from that tiger that you're racing from. Your immune system is going to fight bacteria cells and or bacteria and viruses. And so if you're, you've got both going on, what are you going to do? Are you going to worry about the virus or are you going to run from the tiger? You're going to run from the tiger, right? But when you run from the tiger and your adrenal system kicks in, your immune system is just like, whatever, like it just goes way down. So if you're running from a tiger every day, all day, your immune system's down on the ground. You can't fight anything. So really, that's what I'm learning, and that's where I say, Dossie has been my biggest teacher, because and she's always worried about me talking about her, but I'm like, I'm so thankful. I said to Dossie the other day, I said, I, I kind of flipped my switch and just said, you know, Wow, like I'm getting up in the morning and meditating for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and having, I get up at 5 now and I have till 7, that's time to myself. Because I realized from Dasi the power of the breath, the power of meditation, the power of positive thought. And I said to Dasi, I was like, thank you for having epilepsy, right? If you didn't have that, I would never have changed. And when I change, I'm like the mama bear, right? So like everybody's feeding off of my energy. So when I'm frenetic and in that fight or flight all day, that's with my kids. That's why it's probably hard for Cooper to focus all the time, right? Because <laughs> so, I'm not focused, right? But so if I settle down and settle myself down and give them love and attention, then I have more to give to everybody else. So it's really important to learn to take care of yourself. And I never learned that as a child, ever. It was more like guilt. You know, it's, you shouldn't, you know, God forbid you go take a walk by yourself for an hour, you know? So do for yourself first, and then you can do for others. How um, do you say it can be hard, but stay strong? Stay strong, right? You have to stay strong. And finding happiness despite circumstances, right? Hard, but work hard and stay strong. Yeah, and you do, every day. And have fun. And have fun. Yeah, that's my other lesson, is to have fun. Um, a lot of people told me that throughout my journey more that, you know, you need to have more fun. And my college roommate last year, um, she moved to L.A., which is so awesome. I haven't hung out with her in like 20 years. And she said, our 20th reunion's coming up. And I was like, I can't go. There's just no way. I have so much going on. And I don't really drink. And she's like, what? Like, hold on. You have to come. She ended up paying for a ticket for me to go. And I had a few Hilaritas, which is my tequila kombucha. Um, a few more, but um, I went back and I really lived for the first time in so long. So I don't know what my cells were saying with the tequila, but the rest of my body was saying, thank you. Like, thank you for taking time and letting go of all the worries and going and having fun. And I like, you know, I can't get too into this little cry, but it was like such a valuable lesson to just, you know, we, we only get this one life, so we can't stress, stress about everything. Um, and I told Dossie the other day that um, I went out and I said, Nick, I need you to pick up two easy buttons at Staples. Because the power of the thought, you know, you can grab onto a negative thought and you can hold that thought and you can loop over it and you can be like, oh my gosh, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about this, I'm 
worried about this, and your cells are all responding, it's stress, stress, stress. But just as easily as you can grab that negative thought, you can grab a positive thought. Just like that, it takes one second to switch. So I would tell her sometimes when she's stuck in the thought, like, switch your thought and then go push your easy button. And it's that easy. So it really, so try that sometime when you're, when you're struggling. Um, so expressing your emotion is key. So if you don't express your emotion, that vibration gets stuck inside of you and that affects your cells. Um, so anyway, I think that's most of everything I could go on and on, but I do have a little um, a call to action is that these young, this young generation of kids mm -hmm. is here. And I did this with my high school last week. I asked how many kids are graduating. And I said, please, over the summer, please learn five to 10 recipes that you can take with you. And that you can show off to your friends. They'll be like, wow, you're cool. You know how to cook. I say, Campbell and Cooper are going like, to have girlfriends. No problem, because they're going to be whipping up. And I say, also, it doesn't have to be complicated. Sometimes in our busiest nights, and sometimes more than once or twice a week, it's like, okay, let's just have fried eggs and butter with like sliced avocado and tomato and done. Like it's healthy, it's nutritious, it's inexpensive, and it's delicious. And you don't have to stress. Doesn't mean so much. There's so much about food. There's more cooking shows, more cooking magazines, more stuff on the web, and, but yet people are cooking less and less. So I think that it's getting too overwhelming. The standard is too high that it's got to be so you know perfect and pristine and beautiful. Um, it doesn't have to be. And that's what I want to highlight from these elders. So I'm in the process of um, interviewing elders from different countries. And so I'm looking, I have an intern that's coming in the fall who's in the School of Gerontology. We're getting her master's in that at UCLA. And, um, and she's going to help me, but I'm um, hoping to document their lifestyle suggestions and say, however many, five to ten recipes that they um, that where they're tried and true, and the stories that go along with it. So um, my call to action is to first get mad at every single other kid in the institute and tell them that they should have been here. But then, <laughs> but then be a leader. You guys too. You guys are all very healthy, but be be leaders. And I know it's so tempting. I do, and also find the balance. I say to Doss, you don't have to be perfect. Perfect is boring. Like nobody's perfect. Nothing's perfect. But. The 80-20 rule is really good. If 80% of the time you can be good, then 20% of the time have fun and, and let it go and don't stress about it. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, if anybody has, I hope I got to everything there that it all made sense or not, but that's kind of my story and where I'm at at this moment and um, happy to be here in Topanga where I feel people are very conscious and um, shifting. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions? I wondered if you knew, I read something, it was just like a quick blurb about the appendix and that actually when I was growing up they said it was a vestige thing that like they didn't really know why we even have one right we can live without it but I also heard that actually it keeps healthy bacteria in it so that if you should have you know dysentery or your body purges that it actually can little by little help to um, to reconstitute the biome. Have you heard anything about you that? You know I just read about the appendix a couple of days ago. I was just reading that thing maybe yesterday and that like when you have an appendicitis it's because it's so toxic mm -hmm. that it just can't. It's like wah, 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 alarms going off. So I don't know that it holds I don't know mm -hmm. that it holds something specific that <coughs> bacteria that's feeding the microbiome but it all it all is designed to work. So when things are out of balance and things are toxic, um, that's when the alarms go off, you know. And the bacteria is really, um, you know, what feed, you, I talked about your immune system being on the ground, like what feeds your immune system is your bacteria. So if you don't have healthy bacteria, your immune system is going to be shot. So your bacteria is really everything, 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 everything. So if you can just think every day about how I can feed my bacteria. Mm -hmm. how I, so like Campbell the other day had a splinter 
This is like typical. He has a splinter in his foot. I wasn't home. Our neighbor took it out. He didn't get it all. So the next day he's like, oh, my foot's still killing me. And I like, you know, try to get it out and he was freaking. So I was like, okay, Nick, let's just take him to the emergency room, like numb him up, dig it out, bring him home. So he comes back and he's like, you know, three hours later, everything's three hours at the emergency room. And he's like, they don't do that anymore. They just put iodine on it and gave him crutches and gave him a course of antibiotics. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, so I'm gonna, you want me to like wipe out my child's entire microbiome because with something that I could watch and wait and see if it looks like it's getting infected. I was like, maybe if he had like gangrene or something, I would do that, but. We got free crutches. We got free crutches. But I was like, so I, I was like, okay, we're, you know, we didn't even pick up the prescription, but it was just so telling to me. And then they, they just give them to you and they don't say, okay, so we're gonna give you these, but you know, maybe don't take them unless you, your legs turn green or whatever, but. <laughs> Also, if you do take them, this is what's going to happen inside of you, and this is what you need to do to replenish. So there's no education whatsoever on the microbiome, and I don't know whether doctors don't know, or they're overwhelmed, or it's the status quo to just give antibiotics, and some of them are becoming more conscious. Um, but it's, you know, so the next day I gave him a homeopathic remedy, I soaked it in Epsom salt, the next day I like put a little pressure, and whoop, out came the sponge, it was like this long, and like within 30 minutes I feel like the whole thing had just healed. You know, like your body, his body is just like, okay, thank you, I can heal now. So, um, but most people probably would go home and take a 10 day course of antibiotics and not have any idea. And then they get like, you know, a yeast infection or whatever. Like this, all sorts of things start to pop up where they have candida overgrowth, which a lot of people do, which is an overgrowth of yeast and just wreaks havoc. And then these people are just struggling for years and not knowing what, what to do and all when, you know, and I believe in antibiotics, you know, we do need them, they're here for a reason, but not at the, the rate that they're being given out. So, unfortunately, I feel like you have to be your own best advocate and you have to question your doctors, which is really hard because I think they have good intentions, but I don't think they're always um, as educated on, on other modalities that are out there and, and the microbiome and the effects of things like diet and lifestyle and antibiotics and whatnot. So, um, so always ask, always question, always look things up. Um, and the best thing you can do is, uh, food is foundational. Food is where it's at. And so we, we, you know, our fights always used to be about spending too much money on food. And then now I say, you know, you think food's expensive, wait till you're trying to fight cancer. Everything you wanna do is not covered by insurance. Every appointment that you're driving to, every, you know, medicine you're buying or supplement you're buying or alternative therapy you're doing like it just adds up and I say sometimes like we've gone broke chasing health and like the amount of time like there's no time for fun when you're chasing health you're chasing health because you think maybe this will work or maybe that will work and you know and just imagine what that's doing to your the stress so it's very um, it's so much easier to just stay healthy mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and and why do we wait for that wake-up call right and you can, you can reverse if you have things that are going on that are minimal right now, reverse it. My old babysitter just called and said, oh, I just got diagnosed with diabetes. She's eating like bread all day long, like crabby bread. And I was like, Carlene, you gotta, you know, she's from Trinidad. I was like, go back to the way you ate in Trinidad. Just go back. And in two months, she doesn't have diabetes anymore. <laughs> so it's so easy, you know, and some doctors will put you on insulin for the rest of your life. So, um, yeah. I have a question about inflammation. I read an article um, recently that said so much of the disease that is attributed to, you know, diabetes is attributed to sugar and mm -hmm. things, but if you go even deeper, it's years and years and years of inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what you could do. Yeah, I mean, inflammation is like the source of all. I mean, with diabetes, um, if you, and Alzheimer's is like diabetes of the brain, they say, which my dad has. So, but if you're eating sugar or things that break down to sugar in the body all the time, your pancreas releases insulin because if you keep, it's glucose in the body. So even bread breaks down to glucose or um, starchy vegetables and pastas and cookies and crackers and all this stuff is breaking down to sugar. It's not just white table sugar. 
and um, it turns the glucose in the body. And so your pancreas releases insulin to take it, take the glucose out of the bloodstream because you can't leave it in there or you'll die. And it distributes it to all the cells, give them energy. But what's happening is people are just flooding their bodies like all day long with sugar. And so finally the cells are like, they like close their doors and like, dude, we cannot take any more. Like we're done and we're closed down. And that's when people have metabolic syndrome or become pre-diabetic. And it's just inflammation in the body. Inflammation is just a reaction to, um, I mean, with diabetes, it's just too much glucose in the body. And so, um, but you can reverse that, type two. And, and Dr. Natasha has had success with at least reducing insulin and I think reversing type one in some cases with young children. So, um, and there was a child that was at this event the other day um, who is paleo, or no, ketogenic, on the ketogenic diet and he is type one diabetic and he was able to get almost completely off his insulin mm -hmm. eating that way. So. So food is medicine, for sure, yeah. Um, I was wondering if the villi in your stomach, like the little hairs, do they grow back even after they're damaged? Yeah, so that will, your body wants to be in homeostasis. It wants to be thriving and you're like, you're sloughing off, like all your cells are regenerating every second of every day to adapt and adjust to make you a stronger and healthier individual. They want to be healthy. So everything will, if you feed it properly and you give it the love that it needs, they will all, come back. But you have to be in the process sometimes, right? And you have to be patient. Because it, it sometimes, I say, it takes you a really long time to get where you are. And to get cancer doesn't happen overnight. So it could take, take you a while to regain your health. But it's, it's worth it. And I think like the GAPS diet for some people are like, oh, it's two years. I can't do that. That's such a long time. It's impossible. But when you look at your whole life, two years is like a blip, you know? And to have your health is everything. It's everything. It really is. I have a question in regards to that. I've never heard your birth stories before, and I didn't hear that with the the that the first call yeah. before the before the trial on God. And I've heard recently that someone suggested that anybody who is wanting to get pregnant mm -hmm. intentionally to actually do the diet or a yeah. clean up diet so that yeah. the baby can be born with the best right, stuff. and that's what I was saying to Grace. And Weston Price discovered that, that these cultures had fertility diets. They had special diets that, you know, the young couple, they would feed them spe spe specific foods. Um, and in China, I think they ate like 12 eggs a day to make sure that baby was growing healthy and strong. I mean, they had specific protocols because the, the, the whole purpose was so that their tribe could go on and re procreate. And the way we're going right now, like we're, we're not going to keep procreating if we keep going the way that we are. But yes, so that's my big um, thought and hope for this young generation of kids is that they, they have this chance. And it's hard when you're in college and you're not really thinking about having babies quite yet. But um, you know, if you get married and you're a young couple and you think like, oh, I'm going to have babies, you have this opportunity to really, like my co-author had one baby who had all these issues, and then we wrote her book and she worked really hard to clean up her gut before she had another baby. Because it's, you also don't want to have a baby with issues. You know, I mean, it's, it's much more enjoyable. <laughs> when you want to know about it, it's almost like you can... Once you learn something, you can't unlearn it. Exactly. That's what I say, and that's why I really wanted this message to get out there because I feel like that happened to me like it was just this light bulb went off and, it, and that's when I feel like my family with the judgment and stuff it's like hey learn what I've learned and then criticize me you know go study go read this book or read that so but everybody has their own path and I've learned that too that all you can really do is work on yourself and lead by example so you can't judge anybody because everybody's at a different stage and what Nick wanted to do for his body is Nick's decision Right? And so all you can do is love someone unconditionally and support them. And that is like Snow White. That was like an epiphany right there. That's like Snow White. So even if you don't agree with what someone's doing, just Snow White them and be like, oh, I'm going to give you so much love and attention because that's what your cells need right now. Not the judgment and the fear that you're going to die if you don't do it my way. Right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else? Hillary, I just wanted to mention that I, having been a teacher for a long time, I've been in all these different health plans that constantly change, your doctors, and so I've had like primary care physicians probably 
10 or 15 over the last, whatever, 20 years. And only one of them ever asked me about what I ate and how it got food. And he was somebody who himself, he was an older guy. He, I could tell he was fit. He would talk about exercise. He'd talk about diet. And he, and he was doing it himself. And I think part of the challenge with the medical profession, not talking about these things, is because the individuals themselves are not yet there. There's like still a lot of young, healthy doctors Healthy, you know, like vitality in your body fights this stuff. Right. All the sugars and everything. Yeah, yeah, they so haven't they, felt they have the effects. Sense of invincibility. And I just, I'm feeling like that that whole process of, of getting the medical profession and getting people in these positions of a lot of power over your health practices, to, that, that they're just not even eating. I mean, it's like it's a slow, the grace turning that we talk about is yeah. it's happening in all these pockets everywhere, and yet there's so many doctors who immediately put you on crutches and give you antibiotics for a splinter. I mean, it's like that. It's just so disconnected. Yeah. What, what really is needed. So anyway. Um, yeah, and they're not. I mean, there's so many doctors that would never give chemotherapy to their family. You know, and they get a kickback on chemotherapy, which is frightening. Wow. Yeah. How many, how many hours of, of, of? They get one hour of nutrition. Of nutrition in, in medical school. school. All in medical school. One hour. Wow. One hour. It might be one day, but I think it's one hour. It's minimal. And what they're getting is like the standard American, I mean, they're getting the food pyramid, which isn't really mm -hmm. the way we should be eating. They're not getting any education about traditional foods. They're not talking about um, the benefits of raw milk. It's all fear-based. It's all, you know, it's all, we're run, the food industry is run by a few companies. Continuing, you know, the I mean, continuing education system is driven by the pharmaceutical companies. Right. So the doctors, they're, in this, they're so busy, and they don't actually know except what they're, you know, they, they don't go to the golf course with a, you know, with a pharmaceutical rep and he's saying, well, just, just give them this, this is, this is the new stuff, and you, you know, we'll give you 15% on it, and, and they just slap it at people. And they, you know, get another patient in, get them out, and... And I feel like their hands are tied a little bit in some ways, but I also say kind of shame on you for not learning more. Because supposedly they can be lose their license if they don't recommend chemo radiation or surgery. Um, that's kind of like law. You have to recommend that or else you can lose your license. Which that's is like races but and these guys can demand more and make that change. You need to, to be the shifters. The the young kids can do that. Yeah. And that's where it really it's I mean the the statistics are staggering. It's like by twenty thirty I think it's it's like one in it's like 50% of our boys, I think, will be autistic or something by 2030, which is not far from now. And so, you know, and I don't even really want to get into vaccines, but questioning that too, because there's like 70 something vaccines that a child gets today when, we, when I got maybe 11 or something. And I, you know, it's such a controversial topic, but ask the questions. Can I spread it out? Can I wait a little bit? Does he really need hepatitis B day two of life? You know, is my child um, adopted? And I have no idea what their microbiome is like. Do I feel like I was sick and on a round of antibiotics when I was pregnant? And I don't want to give them that right now. You know, like you have to question because I didn't, I didn't know any better. And I was so overwhelmed with triplets and whatnot, and I was so young that I just trusted my doctor. I remember going in with my triplets, they were so little when they were getting vaccines, and I wanted to know more, and I was like, would you do it if you were me? And he's like, well, I did it to my kids, and I was like, all right. You know, I just, did, I just trusted, and that's what's so sad now is that you can't necessarily trust. You can trust that they want to do the right things, but they may not know what the right thing, and only you, everybody, every single body is different. So what one baby needs is totally different than what another baby needs. And when one baby, you know, has a reaction to a vaccine, it doesn't mean that the next baby is. My mom will say, you know, well, you're fine and so-and-so's fine. I mean, it's like it all depends on there. She'll call me and say, you need to go get the flu shot. Somebody kid died in Iowa from the flu. I'm like, well, who knows what's going on in that guy's body? You know, like, I feel like I'm healthy and strong and I can fight off the flu, God forbid. And it's only going to make my immune system stronger. But there's this, you know, and the flu shot is making lots of money. So um, just questioning, question, 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 and don't just, you know, fall in line with everything else. And just lead, and don't be afraid to lead. Um, it's, somebody said once, what makes the great great is that they don't listen to the naysayers. 
So, you know, there's a lot of naysayers out there that don't believe in um, what I'm doing or what, uh, you know, a lot of people are trying to do to change, to turn the ship around. The great turning, trying to do it. And it, it, um, it's going to happen, I say, from the ground up. It's certainly not going to happen from the top down. And with collaboration, I wore this shirt today because it's Cam G's um, business and she's opened a store and I want to support her. And I, I think, you know, a lot of us in life can have um, envy or jealousy or, you, you know, you just want to, you want to be the best, this, that, best, that. But it's all going to happen from collaboration. It's all about joining together. It's all about creating this groundswell from the bottom up and one by one. It's one person at a time, one bite at a time sometimes that it's going to change. So, but supporting, you know, each other and supporting the mission is really what's important. So, it says, Jennifer, well, you can sing it, right? Uh, Miss <laughs> Jenny, that, that, that was you. We, um, we are stardust and we are... We are, we are stardust, yeah. Yeah. So, um... I wrote an article the other day that was like, are we looking for inspiration in all the wrong places? Um, I don't know if that's what it's called, or what I titled it. I haven't sent it off to, the, to be published yet. But it was about like, you know, we're looking at these magazines of perfection, of these models and whatnot, and everybody's perfect. Why aren't we looking at the old lady that's like got boobs down to here with wrinkles everywhere, and she's got this infectious laugh that just makes you want to be around her, or that guy with no legs that's like got this tenacity that you know he's going to be able to do anything in the world. You know, like there's inspiration everywhere, but we can get caught up in perfectionism and, and trying to be something that we're, we're not when really it all comes from our microbes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Your beauty's in your microbes. So, um, so yeah, looking for those little gifts from the elders and the people that uh, have something that, you know, I, in the beginning of the article, I don't know if you guys remember when Harry met Sally. Mm -hmm. Remember that movie? Mm -hmm. The famous scene in the cafe. Mm -hmm. um, I won't get into that, but she, I mean, the old woman's like, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> so it's like, you know, <laughs> we want to have a little bit more of what those elders have. They have something that we don't, that we're missing, we're lacking. You know, they've had this life experience that we want to turn back and I think try and capture that with a modern day twist because one French woman said to me who was 92, she said, Hillary, you can't dismiss that there are single working moms out there that are trying to hold it together. And how are they to put a meal on the table every day and every night? And I see them standing in line at Whole Foods every day. So um, finding the way to do this with a modern twist, living as traditionally as we can with a modern day twist is sort of what Liv Yum Yum is trying to do. So. Well, Hillary, we got wrong. Stay strong, Doss. We need a t-shirt for you. So I definitely want you to come in and share this talk with the high school class. Yes, so please. Yeah, we'll do I'm going to have some yeah. sort of reprimand. Bring yeah, I'll bring yeah. broth. Yeah, so we'll definitely get them in, in the story. Maybe the eighth graders can join us too, Jennifer. Right. And, and then also just, you know, we've talked about this, but really wanting you know, the collaboration between you and Elizabeth and others on our staff that, that can help kind of consolidate all these pieces that we all want. Right. And, um, and, and be able to make these, really these inroads into the diets of them. And I have to tell you, and I know that we've talked about it, it kind of has to start with me personally, just as a head of school. Your vision. And yeah, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly how to do that, but I, I want to have more conversations. Yeah, with you. well. Because I know when I'm in alignment physically with my own food and what I'm putting in my body, then it's very, very natural for me to pay attention to it elsewhere. And working the way I do, I, I you know. I, Get I'm, stressed. I'm not, well, yeah, and there's an eating component to that, which right. is. Very soothing, yeah. You know, and it's way less um, um, sort of derailing than, like, say, drugs or alcohol. Right, 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 you know, just, right. You know, I can do that. Um, so, um, yeah. but really mindful that 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 has a shelf life. You know. Yeah. Well, and it's important with some with a place like Manzanita. I know my, you know, EJ is God. So it's like if she puts it out, it's healthy to the kids. So making sure that we know. I said in my talk last week that you know supporting your local farmers is the cheapest way of healthcare, pretty much. Learning to cook and supporting your local farmers is the cheapest form of healthcare. And so I happen to have a knack for connecting with farmers, and I love supporting them. And, and they, 
Um, and they, in turn, support me. And they, in turn, would embra they've embraced the school and they're excited to work with the school. And I think for the children to really uh, understand that whole process and, and maybe intern at the farms and see the cycle of life and see the hard work and dedication that goes into this, this food and appreciate that, you know, the love and nourishment that they, and the life that the animals had or whatnot, whether it's vegetables or animals, but the, the effort that went into it and the, I was at a farm yesterday, this biodynamic farm in Moore Park called Apricot Lane, and I'm going to go up and teach them some, they're opening a restaurant, and it's just super cool. It's biodynamic, and they're doing stuff with Oprah's Super Soul Sundays or whatever, and um, they're doing every, everything right, and it's just really cool to see. Um, but that's a place that she said they don't typically do this, but it, you know, because she knows me that we could somehow maybe figure something out with the school. And I'd love for these kids, to, they would think it's, I mean, she, she had a worm composter from here to there. It's like they don't even make them anymore. They're, it was huge. And they're doing this whole Steiner, uh, Steiner-esque, I just posted about it, you can see on Instagram. Um, and I put like 10 pictures or whatever, but they, um, they have like this wisdom that Rudolf Steiner had of, taking like the dandelion and putting it in the inside the organ of a certain animal that that dandelion green is supposed to be it composts well with the organs and then they bury that together and then a year later they dig that up and then they make this compost tea out of that mm -hmm. and so it, whether it's you know she said you know maybe if Steiner were here today he'd say okay let's not we don't need to get a deer if there are no deer around you can find a gopher because there's a million of them here but there was very specific it was like homeopathy for the land it was just really fascinating, and I feel like these kids would just sink right into it and get it. And the soil is where the soil, so right next to this beautiful farm is this raspberry farm that had like hoop house after hoop house after hoop, like you could see, you know, forever hoop houses of just raspberries. And they're organic, but it's all monocrop. So monocrop is that they just keep planting raspberries year after year, year after year. There's no crop rotation, there's no, um, cover cropping and there's no care to the soil really so the nutrients are lost and you're not you're maybe eating an organic raspberry but there's not really much to it and then it maybe sits on the shelf for two weeks and then you eat it so really realizing the power of permaculture and um, biodynamic soil and the soil is what is our most endangered resource right now in many ways. So putting the nutrients back in the soil, getting animals and ruminants back on the land. Um, there's a whole nother, Alan Savory is doing this whole thing about the desertification of the land. You know, there's so much land that is desert now. And by putting ruminants back on the land, they can break the earth up with their hoofs. And then if with a little care, they can, you know, the animals poop and they put, you know, these the Savory Institute will come in and help regenerate with some water, whatever, and sure enough, the entire area will regenerate. So ruminants are very important. I mean, it's not the animals that we need to demonize, it's the management of the animals that we need to demonize. So um, there is a cycle that has happened for many years with Great lots of... sucks up the carbon from the atmosphere as well. It fights greenhouse. Yeah, greenhouse yeah. The entire cycle. Yeah. I mean, healthy soil. It's where it's at. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, and that was one story I was going to tell us about how when I this year arrived and I was wanting to talk about Dossie uh, with the teachers and whatnot, how we're going to manage the epilepsy, whatever, and all that. And Dr. Paul and like eight teachers came to this meeting, and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. This is so. It made me want to cry. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, and Dr. S Paul said, this is something to the effect of like, this is a holistic treatment. We're treating the whole of Dossie. And I thought, oh my gosh. Like, again, I've landed in the right place. Like, it's not just about like how we're going to manage this symptom or that symptom. We're going to look at Dossie as a whole and how we can best support her. And that's really what it's all about, you know? So obviously, she's thriving. <laughs> I don't know, right? <laughs> oh, opposite day, yes. <laughs> Only on opposite day. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for making the best school. You're, Dorothy, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mom, my mom had said, um, 
You know, well, are they learning the periodic table? Are they learning this? Are they going to be able to go to college? And this guy, Bruce Lipton, which I encourage you all to seek out his information. This, I believe, is the new story, is that your thoughts create your reality. And he was like, we're facing the sixth mass extinction of the planet. And for the first time, it's caused by man, mankind. And so I was sitting there thinking about that. And I'm like, well, it doesn't really matter if they know the periodic table if we're not even around to do anything with it. <laughs> so Manzanita is teaching us how to, you know, more important things like let's save the world and let's do, you know, figure out how to live sustainably and support each other and whatnot. So, um, and I said, even when I went back to my high school, I said, you know, it's not the periodic table that I remember or earth science or conjugation of the French verbs. It's the... Um, the teachers showing up every day, showing up for us and motivating us and inspiring us and our peer group, my peer group, and the teachers had lunch with us, which is so nice, so important. And then my peer group was this level that was, I always say it was like playing up a level in soccer, like when you play up, you, you play better. And I felt like my peers were like that for me, like they made me want to be better and do better and reach for my dreams. And so I feel like that's how Manzanita is, there's kind of this higher level here where people are really motivated and they get it. And so that's why I was super excited to talk to this audience. So anyway, I'm sure I over talked now. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You get extra loaf of bread for you or something. Whole pound of butter. And organic pastures donated like lots of butter to us. So raw butter. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you all. Uh, I just want to say oh. a final uh, thank you to all of you for coming. It was really great hearing from Hillary. I know it was, and I know you all know it was. So thank you for that. That's really sweet. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, awesome.